Bible club. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I do appreciate you. Awesome. Well, praise the Lord. It's good to be at Part Time Bible School, and um, we only have this is our going to be our last teaching class for this one because uh, next month we'll have a final exam. Which don't stress, it's not going to be too hard. It's only going to be going over things that we've learned about. Um, also, in terms of the achievement, there are some assignments that do need to be completed for the achievement. Um, one is the judge's essay, and then it's the tabernacle drawing or model, or the final essay, the 2,000 word paper. So those have to be turned in this month in order to get the achievement level. So um, they can be emailed to me, or you can give them to me next month, but it just might, it might be a little bit of a a quick turnaround to get it graded because I'll be going back to the States in July. So I'll try my best to get it all completed and graded back to you. Do you have any questions about that? Yeah, I'm able to, to just I've got my laptop today, so Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Sounds good. I'm not I'm not too worried, so I think we'll be we'll be good. Um we? yes. Have you received all mine? I have. I have received everything. I have your John paper. I just haven't had a chance to grade it yet, but I will have it back to you before next month for sure. Hopefully this week. Thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, okay, so last month we went over um, the pre exilic and post exilic periods of the nation of Israel. Uh, a little bit gloomy, kind of the things that were taking place in Israel, but it all becomes so much more worth it when we start to talk about the New Testament and the things that were taking place in that. So um, today we're going to be going over, our final class is going to be just an overview of the New Testament. And it's so cool because in Bible survey we talk about, you know, creation, then we go into um, the, found, the flood, the founding uh, patriarchs of the nation of Israel, and there's just so much happening in the Old Testament, but what it really does is it just prepares the way, it paves the way for the perfect and fullness of the time for when Jesus comes and completely shakes up the entire world. And now we're still living in that, that shaking, that stirring that he brought when um, he came and died for our sins, rose again, and then we see that the church is established and the church is thriving today. So it's an exciting period to study, and really it is it is probably the most studied of any period because we have so much more uh, documentation, we have so much more history regarding the life of Christ than we do about, say, Abraham. Um, it, and, and that is one of my favorite things about the faith that we live in is, historically speaking, Jesus is not a fairy tale, ca ca fairy tale character. He's not, you know... Um, you know, like Peter Pan or something. He lived, breathed, dwelt among us. There's history to back up everything that took place in the New Testament, and that's exciting. And that reminds us of uh, just a pillar of our faith. So uh, the first thing we're going to go over is the historical bridge handout, which you should have. And it's going to have like this bridge on it, and it's going to basically give us an overview of the connecting between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Um, but before we do that, does someone want to turn to Galatians 4.4? 4? Galatians 4.4. 4. Um, just so you are aware, I'm going to be um, monitoring Sister Vicki's class next month. I hope you all know that there is a test in that class, correct? Mm -hmm. I hope so, because there is a test. And I'll be, I'll be giving that out. Um, for those in Sunderland, I got the test a bit late. So I'm going to email it to you if that's okay. Um, it is open note and open Bible exam next class. So uh, you're able to uh, pull it up on the computer, type on it, and send it back if you'd like. Or you're welcome to print it out and send it back to us later. Um, but that will be available for you. So just a, just a heads up. Galatians 4 4.
sometimes can be kind of hard because they're so thick. And it's Galatians. Okay, go ahead and read loud. <clears throat> but when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. Okay, so this scripture, I think, is just a, 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 a wonderful <coughs> scripture to demonstrate the background and the kind of the perfect timing of God in the preparation and the timing for when Jesus came. They're really, I mean, the setting could not have been more perfect for the gospel to be spread at this time. Um, there's some national factors that made that take place, and it's almost like um, this, this there, there comes a point where the time is so full, it is so the right time. Have you, have you ever had an experience where it was like, oh my goodness, the timing could not have been more perfect. It couldn't have been more perfect because everything was set in just a perfect setting for the, just the, the perfect event to take place. And that's, that's exactly what the life of Christ came into. Um, it may not have looked like it from the outside. It wasn't the greatest period for Jewish history. At this point, they were spread about. Um, there wasn't like a strong uh, sense of Jewish unity. They didn't have a home of their own. But it was a perfect time for Christ to come and s spread the, the gospel, to spread the, um, the good news that, that there is salvation for us. So the natural factors in working out this divine plan, um, there was the Persian the proclamation of Cyprus and the return of the Jews, so they were allowed to go out of exile back to wherever they wanted to go to, you know, build up the temple, to practice their own religion, which they had not been able to do while they were in exile. Um, there was the Grecian, there was the conquest of Alexander, resulting in the spread of the Greek language. So before this time, you know, some people were still speaking Aramaic, some people were still speaking Hebrew, maybe people were speaking, you know, I'm not even sure of all the languages, but because of the conquest of the Greek, everybody was speaking the same language. So there was an opportunity for someone to come along and, and speak to so many people because they all were speaking in the same language. So that is, that's an amazing factor. And if you just look at the dynamic of that, and then you look at the present day, how English is, is quickly becoming the most spoken language in the world. I mean... Almost every nation is beginning to teach their children how to speak English because it's the, it's the language of the world right now. What better way for us to be able to cross over language barriers to shed the gospel to people? I mean, that's exciting, the time that we're living in. Um, the next was uh, the Roman, the establishment of a worldwide stable government, uniform laws, and good roads. So what happened is Rome came in and they said, we are going to start paving roads up. Um, um, I think there's like a saying about roads in Rome, but I can't remember it right now. Maybe, maybe, I'll, maybe it'll come up to me later. But um, it's quotes like "When in Rome, do with the Romans," those sort of things. They really, they were, they were ruling the world at this time. But they were also producing good transportation, good roads for people to travel on, which made it possible for travel and commercially to become more prominent. So, what better way for, again, the gospel to be spread? than with this new development in worldwide, um, basically, travel opportunities. And then lastly is the, the Jewish, the dispersion of the Jews spreading the doctrine of the unity of God, the Messianic hope, and the Holy Scripture. So the Jews, after their exile, were dispersed around um, Palestine, um, in Rome. They were basically everywhere. There was this dispersion of Jews, and they were basically setting up synagogues and wherever they went to practice their religion. So they were beginning to show people, look at the history of our nation and, and the, the, the sacrifices and the, the law that we follow. It was just kind of building a, um, they were building a reputation around the world, the Jews, because they had such a history. They may not have been a united nation, but they were still like dispersed showing and spreading what was happening. So um, all of these things happened, but in between where all that took place was what we call the 400 years of silence. So it was that kind of that bridge where no prophets were prophesying. There wasn't any, I mean, major developments taking place. Um, but what it did was all of these things prepared the way for Christ to come. So. Um, the events immediately preceding the advent of Jesus was the announcement to Zechariah of the coming of the forerunner of Jesus. 
the Annunciation to Mary of the coming of the Messiah, and the preaching of John the Baptist. So before Christ was born, there were these, like the first you know, prophecy that was spoken was actually to um, Zacharias and Elizabeth with the saying that you know, John the Baptist is coming uh, to prepare the way for Christ. So God is beginning to speak to people about the coming of the Messiah, which is really just an amazing time to live in and be a part of. So that's the historical bridge between the Old Testament and the New Testament, but it, it also is just a reminder of, again, God's perfect timing. Um, just as he did it for the, the birth, life, crucifixion, and resurrection of Christ, he can do the same in our lives. He has a perfect timing for everything. So um, moving on to the next handout, we're just going to go over the Gospels and the divisions of the New Testament. I do know that uh, some of this is covered in your Life of Christ class, so I don't want to be too redundant. Um, can anyone tell me what the Synoptic Gospels are? Anyone remember what the Synoptic Gospels are? I do know that this is going to be on your test, uh, but the Synoptic Gospels are consist of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And the reason we call them the Synoptic Gospels is because they cover a lot of the same material and it's, it's spoken from many of the same uh, perspective. Um, and then the one that is not the Synoptic Gospel is the Gospel of, anyone know? The fourth Gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John is basically the kind of the outside of the Gospels because he only like, I think 93% of the material in John is all new. It's not really covered in the previous Gospels because he was writing for a specific purpose, and his purpose was to demonstrate the deity of Christ, not just his humanity, which historically Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they tend to speak to. So what do we learn about Jesus from the Gospels? Uh, we, uh, we find in the Gospels the ministry of John the Baptist, the birth of Jesus, the life of Jesus, the ministry and calling of Christ and his disciples, his miracles, his death, burial, and resurrection. So the, the focus of the Gospels is really about the life, the birth, life, ministry, and final ascension of Christ after the crucifixion. And that, that, that is mainly their sole purpose is almost introducing us to this, this man from Galilee. That is the pr purpose of the Gospels. What we do not find there's no Christian church found in the Gospels. We, we don't hear of anyone receiving the Holy Ghost within the Gospels. Men could repent and have their sins forgiven in the Gospels, such as the thief on the cross um, or the man with the palsy. However, full salvation or conversion was not possible until after Jesus was crucified and ascended. So the Gospels really were a leading up point before the pouring out of God's Spirit. Warning, we must go on to the book of Acts to find where the first church was founded. So full, full salvation was first experienced on the day of Pentecost. Um, and there's an important, in John 17, 20, we note the authority that's given to the apostles by the Lord. So in, in um, John 17, 20, there is a, a, the statement that's made. Let me grab my Bible here and we'll read it together. Sorry, I did have it up here and then I got it. Okay, so John 17, 20. And you know, knowing these divisions from the Bible, knowing kind of like how it's laid out, really can give us a good understanding when we're reading each book of the Bible, almost like a lens of, of reading to help us, you know, even when we speak to people about what we believe and, and uh, certain maybe arguments that might come forth, it's always good to know first and foremost what the Bible says. So in John 17, 20, it says, and these pages are very thin. Okay. Neither pray I for these alone, but for us. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. So basically Christ is saying, through the word of the apostles and what they preach, people are going to believe on me, and an authority has been given unto them. 
And so that's why we, we often look to the book of Acts, we look to the lives of the apostles to remind us what the early church was supposed to look like, what salvation was to look like in the day and age that we're living in. Because we are still living epistles of the book of Acts. And that is so exciting. The book of Acts does not have an ending. Um, you know, uh, it's so amazing. If you go to, um, I think it's really cool. If you go to the very last, and this isn't in my notes, it's just like a tidbit, but if you go to the very last, the book of John, it always ends with amen, right? If you go to the book of Matthew, it ends with amen. If you go to the book of Mark, it ends with amen. If you go to the book of Luke, it ends with amen. But when you go to the book of Acts and you finish, it, it, it ends with a command. It ends with a um, it basically says, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. That is the end of Acts. There is no amen. There is no stopping point. It's still, it is still continuing today. The church is moving on. We are still uh, living epistles of the, the gospel of Christ. So Acts is, uh, we are still the church today, and that's exciting. And so um, there are... I, okay, the handout that you have says that there are three divisions of the New Testament. Uh, technically, uh, I mean, Revelation we tend to look at as a book of prophecy, but prophecy, but it was an epistle. It was a letter from John, um, the revelation of Jesus. So we really we categorize it as the Gospels, the Book of Acts, and the epistles. Um, and you can separate those epistles into what we call the Pauline epistles, which were all written by Paul to the churches. Or we can, um, and then the general epistles, which is Hebrews through Jude, um, and then the Apostle of John, which is Revelation. So um, the book of Acts is our book of salvation. It's, uh, we learn how to be born again. Um, what do we find in the book of Acts? We find that men were born again. John 3, 5 says that they were fulfilled. The first church was founded on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. We learn about water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ, at the church at Jerusalem, at Samaria, at Caesarea, at Ephesus, all the apostles and Mary, the mother of Jesus, prayed until they were filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The baptism of the Holy Ghost through the evidence of speaking in tongues we find at the church at Jerusalem, at Caesarea, at Ephesus. Not one person in the entire Bible was ever baptized using the words in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost. The only time that that's mentioned is in Matthew 28, 19, and it's all referencing the name of the Father, the name of the Son, and the name of the Holy Ghost, which is Jesus Christ. And that is how every New Testament believer is baptized. And that formula, the baptism in Jesus' name, there is power in that. And Acts is, is such a great history of that. You can go into Waterstones, or you can go into, you know, Barnes & Noble, and you can get a book like this thick on the history of baptism. And what that book is going to basically lead you back to was a full immersion baptism that took place in the early church. It didn't have sprinkling, it didn't have those things, and it is going to come back to the baptismal formula of what the apostles did, the name of Jesus Christ. But what's happened is people will take loopholes or they'll take scriptures out of context, and that's why we have this giant book on the, the history of baptism is because it's just been twisted and turned into every different thing, right? I mean, now, you know, you, you, you stick your finger in a bottle of water, put it on your head, put it on the, your ear, and you say that you are baptized. It's, it's crazy. Um, so we have to just be careful to remember, what is the scripture telling us, okay? It is, it is very interesting to study the history of baptism. It's interesting to see how it went from, you know, something like full immersion to just dipping your, your finger in water. Um, but when we look to the book of Acts, which is our history of the early church, it gives us a clear definition of what was being taken. The Bible says that they came out of the water. They, that means they were, they were in it, and then they came out of it. So um, if the apostles and Mary, the mother of Jesus, were wrong in believing the above scriptures, then there is no hope for any of us. Basically, Galatians 1, 8, and 9 lets us know that really, if, if, if people like the apostles had it wrong and the Mary, the mother of Jesus, had it wrong, then we've got some serious trouble because they literally like walked with Jesus. They, they heard him speak. They, they knew what he was doing. So I think that there is plenty of um, substance and there's enough history to remind us that we look to the apostles. We look to the book of Acts to find 
our salvation formula, to find what it is that we need to do. And I, I, I think that this kind of might be my, the thing that I like to talk about the most. But what I find so compelling about the gospel, so compelling about the Acts 2.38 message, is that it answers the question we all want to know. What must I do to be saved? What do I need to do to get to heaven? Just tell me, right? And, and there are people walking around, you know, who go to church every Sunday, who, who do all the things they know to do, but they're still asking that question. What do I need to do to actually be saved, to make sure that I have eternal salvation? And God is so gracious and loving that, of course, he's going to give us a definitive answer. And Acts 2.38 for me is that answer. We repent, we are baptized in Jesus' name, we are filled with the Holy Ghost, and we walk through this process of sanctification until we, we go into glory. And I think that knowing that makes me confident in knowing that, that I have a relationship with God, that I am redeemed, that, I'm, that I am ready if God were to come today, or if my life were to be taken tomorrow. I know, I know with confidence that I have done the things that the Bible tells us to do. And I'm striving toward holiness. So that is so exciting, and it's, it's uh, overwhelming at times how much God loves us and cares about us. Um, okay, the last one, which is probably where we focus a lot, because once we are repentant of our sins, baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost, and living, um, the, the, this is where the hard part comes, right? It's actually striving after and doing what God has called us to do once we're saved, which is reaching the lost, which is living a holy lifestyle, which is, you know, being living epistles for Christ. So this is why, you know, a majority of the New Testament text is actually directly being, like, spoken to people that are already saved. And the new, the, 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 the new epistles that Paul was writing to the Corinthian church and the, the church in Ephesus, they were, some of them were, they had some really bad stuff going on. And this wasn't just people like that didn't know about Christ. These were people in the church, people that were that were in the book of Acts. And he was needing to write to them to tell them, hey, you need to make sure you're abstaining from sexual immorality. Hey, you need to make sure that you are you are preaching the gospel, that you are staying on fire. And so this is how we learn how to live a Christian life, which I'm so grateful for because we really do need to be taught at times. It does not come naturally to be Christ-like. And thank God for the Holy Ghost that enables us and gives us the ability, gives us the, the, the strength that we need to be living epistles. So what do we find in the epistles? These books were written to the churches after they were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and after they received the baptism of the Holy Ghost speaking with tongues. Why were the epistles written? To instruct born-again Christians, not sinners, how to live, how to worship, church discipline, and how to develop the fruits of the Spirit. So all of these things were not written to people who didn't know a thing about Christ. They were written to people who were already baptized in His name, filled with His Spirit. They still needed teaching and direction. And that's a reminder to us. It's really easy for some people, once they, um, they're they saved, to think, wow, I have got this taken care of, check the box for salvation, and now I can go do whatever I want. Uh, and that's not what the scripture says at all. It reminds us that we, we still need to be taught. And, and I, I commend you who are in Bible school because you're recognizing I still need to learn about the word. This Bible, it, I, it's just filled with so many treasures that I could study it for life, my entire life, and still have more to learn. Um, the... Um, I believe it's the Gospel of John that says that the works of Christ, you know, not enough books to fill the world could talk about Christ and his life and the works that he did, which is just a reminder to us that the study of the Word of God, the learning that we have to achieve, we're not going to arrive, we're not going to be the perfect Christian until we get to glory. And that's... Um, yeah, that's, that is part of it. We're, we're continuously learning. And as soon as we stop growing, as soon as we stop learning the word, we're dying. Technically. If, if you're not growing, if you're not eating the word, if you're not trying and practicing the Christian life, then you're beginning to die. You're beginning to step away from it. Even if you're 90 years old, there's still opportunities to learn. I know that sometimes we'll, 
and I've talked about this in our previous classes, and I think it's something I'm, I'm very um, weary of. I just want to make sure that even as I get older, we gain more experiences, we know more about life. It's so easy to say, you know, I've been there. I don't really need to go back to school. I don't need to learn that. I've heard it a million times. I don't need to study this, or I don't need to do that. But there's just always an opportunity to continue studying the Word. Don't ever, ever let that die. Don't ever let your passion for knowing about the Word of God, don't let it diminish just because life has happened to you. There are still people that are 90 years old that are out there making a difference, trying new things, uh, spreading the gospel, witnessing to people. There's always an opportunity, and I think some of the best years of our life might be wasted in old age. Because we're just like, oh, I've, 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 I've done it all. I've, I've already paid the piper. I've, I've gone through all the hard times. I've done all the Bible studies. I don't need to do that anymore. Give it to the young people. But I, the, the life of Christ is a, con the Bible says that God is a consuming fire. He's a consuming fire. And if a consuming fire is what God is, and that's what's living inside of us, then that means that our life needs to be a consuming fire. Not just our teens, not just our... Um, you know, ages 30 to 50, we, we are consuming fire our entire life. And I, I think I get on this because I really want that. I look at what does my legacy want to be, and my legacy doesn't want to be that I made it to, like, you know, 40 or 50, and then I stopped doing everything that I had said I was passionate about. So let it be a warning to us that this, this life that we're living, it just... It, it continues on. We are continuously striving after the things of God. And you know what? We're all going to make mistakes. We're all going to mess up. We're all going to do things we wish we wouldn't have done. But that's why God has given us these epistles. That's why he's given us this teaching. Because, hey, he knows we're going to make mistakes. He knows we're not going to be perfect Christians. Um, and look at the grace that he had for Peter. Look at the grace that he had for his disciples when they, when they messed up. He said, come, follow me. Keep doing what you need to be doing. I, I, I was speaking to someone the other day. We were talking about um, Judas, you know, and how he betrayed Christ and how that was perhaps, I mean, it was his, of course it was his downfall, but there was still grace for Judas. He still could have repented. He didn't have an understanding or a grasp of, of really what was in store for him in salvation. But there was grace for him. Even though he betrayed Christ, even though he completely seemed like he did the most horrific thing possible, there was still grace. Um, okay, so that is the division of the Old Testament. I want to talk really quickly about the four Gospels and who they're written to. So um, there is a, t a uh, note on here that Matthew, the book of Matthew was written to the Jews who believed the Old Testament, and it's portrayed as Jesus as the Messiah and King. So as you read the book of Matthew, and you've probably already read it for your life of Christ, but there, Matthew, um, he was writing to a specific audience with a specific purpose in mind. And if you read the Gospels with that understanding, it can help... Um, it can help bring them more to life. Mark was writing to the Romans who stressed power and service and that Jesus was the mighty conqueror and the servant. Um, Luke was writing to the Greeks who believed in the beauty of, and wisdom of man and that Jesus is the perfect man and Jesus is the son of God. And then John was writing to the church and talking about the deity of Christ and how he was the son of God. I think a lot of people might be, okay, why did we need four books of the Bible to all to talk about kind of different perspectives of the life of Christ? What is so astounding about the New Testament is that, you know, we hear about Alexander the Great, we hear about, uh, you know, different popes, different uh, people in history. The life and ministry of Jesus Christ is so well recorded in the New Testament that we have, we have perspectives from four different individuals who walked with Jesus at different times, and they all they all write about a cohesive experience. They they literally kind of defy um, historical records in some place because they're so accurate. They're so well unified, and, and that is so that's unique to find. You don't really find that in the history of Alexander the Great. Um, so that's 
just really cool. I don't really know how to put it any other way, except that it's good and it's really cool to have such a, a specific history of the life of Christ. Okay, there's also another sheet on the differences between the synoptics and the Gospel of John, uh, which you can read over, but that's just some more facts of why we separate the synoptic Gospels from the book of John. And then I also have the sheet on prophecies concerning Jesus Christ, which is again adds to the authenticity of the Bible, um, talking about how it was prophesied about the coming of Christ and how he fulfilled every single prophecy of the Old Testament. Um, there's a chronological table of Christ's life and what was taking place from eight, um, 5, 4 BC all the way to 33 AD. Um, but the one I want to spend the rest of the time on is, I'm just trying to find it here. Okay, it's, it, it probably is on the back of the Synoptic Gospels handout, but it says four gospel glimpses of Jesus Christ. So it's a really, really good breakdown of the four gospels and what each of them were um, prophesying toward. So um, Matthew, Mark, Luke, we just talked about what they were, who they were writing to and what their purpose was and, for, and how they were portraying Jesus. Um, some of the key words in the book of Matthew was that um, fulfilled, and Matthew really describes kind of this fulfillment of time. He, he begins the book with the lineage of Christ saying, look at, you know, how we have gotten to where we are. Um, the key verse is 21.5, and uh, Maria, do you want to read Matthew 21.5? <coughs> Tell thee the daughter of Zion, before thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass, and the crowd of all of an ass. Right. So it's a, it's a key scripture in the verse because um, Matthew is describing him as a king, saying, here he is. And at this time for people to describe Christ as king and as the coming Messiah was demonstrating that he really was what was prophesied in the Old Testament about a king over the Jews, someone to reign um, <coughs> over them. Okay, so the outstanding feature of the book of Matthew is the sermons. Correct? So this is where we get the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, Matthew chapter 5. It's one of, it is the most famous sermon ever preached, and it's where Christ was up on the Mount of Olives, and he was, he was, just, he was just rocking people's world with completely like groundbreaking, profound things that he was saying about um, living for God. Hi there, Stanley. Are you with us? Stanley is here. Well, it's good to have you with us. Um, the arrangement of the material is that it's topical, so it does go from topic to topic. The tone is prophetic. The percent of it that is spoken by Christ is 60%, over 50 or 53 quotations from the Old Testament, 76 allusions to the Old Testament, and 42% unique material. Which means, in unique, it means that it, it wasn't shared with the rest of the Gospels, or in the Gospels. Um, also, have you mute, uh, mute your mic if you haven't done so? Okay. Okay, so going through Mark, it's a similar, uh, where it's the highlight, outstanding features is the miracles. It goes in chronological. It has a much more practical approach 